I came to Southern Oregon College in 1974 as a temporary in a temporary position, replacing jo, Joanne uh, Widness, who went on sabbatical for a year. And so right away, I started coaching volleyball and tennis, taking her place. And then the following year, the posi a position opened, and so I applied for it, and I got the position. So I was at that time an assistant professor, and uh, my new role as assistant professor in health and physical education, um, and also with athletics, I was uh, coaching field hockey and women's basketball. And of course in 1972 was the Title IX Act, the Equal Opportunity Amendment to the Human Rights Act, and uh, so we were in the process of equalizing our program, which is very difficult to do. And at first, it was very hard to interpret what Title IX actually was. But uh, it means what it says, equal opportunities for men and women. And uh, so we started progressing toward it. And I must say that the campus is still progressing toward it. So uh, it's very hard when there's a football program of over a hundred men playing football to equalize and to equalize a program for women uh, with that number. And so I think when I got here in '74, there were like 18 sports, and for both men and women, and um, just through. Um, financial crisis that the state had over the years. Uh, they were cutting sports by the late 70s and another time the late uh, the early 1980s they cut more sports. So I had already coached volleyball and tennis and basketball and field hockey and um, my new role was um, assistant coach of track and field and cross country. And so I, and also I, I kept assisting the basketball, the women's basketball program. But when I got here, the, bas the women's basketball team was practicing in, the, in a small gym, which was called the girls' gym. And, uh, we immediately started scheduling our games and started scheduling a comparable um, s uh, schedule as the men had. And um, I can remember at one, at, at the men's basketball games, the announcer would say, there'll be a dance after the game in the girls' gym. <laughs> We changed that. I can remember delivering notes to him saying that's, that's not appropriate anymore. But I, my mentors here at SOU were Bev Bennett, Marion Forsyth, Ruth Beber, Joanne Widness, plus the men in the program. The men were our models for our athletic program. And um, Dr. Burt Merriman was chair of the uh, health and Physical Education Department, um, Jerry Inslee, Joe Brown, and um, those were, it seemed, oh, Bob Ream, who is the legendary wrestling coach, and um, there were just a really good basis for health and physical education as well as athletics. And of course, the men's program, those, that was our model that we followed uh, for better or for worse. And um, soon the women were in the Raider Athletic Association uh, as far as getting scholarships, not as much as the men, but, uh, and I'm not sure what that is to this day, if it's equal, but at least they're progressing towards. Let's see. Um, I, when I went to the University of Oregon in the Health and Physical Education program, which was an, an excellent program, um, 
I was a real generalist. I did everything. I, you know, in, in our um, preparation program, we uh, went through all types of sports. We went through anatomy, physiology, and had our, uh, got our degree in science and um, biology. <clears throat> so I was a real generalist, and when I entered the program, uh, Dr. Merriman just, uh, you know, I said, I'll do it with anything that he asked. So I taught a lot of different, of, um, different subjects, and I, I did a lot with teacher education, and we still, all around the county, and uh, especially in Southern Oregon, we have so many teachers in health and physical education and coaches that went through the Southern Oregon program. Um, I'm really proud of them. In fact, Josh Rolfling, the volleyball coach, is one, was one of my students. Um, Charlie, the football coach, was one of my students. Um, yeah, Charlie Hall and Mike Ritchie, the wrestling coach, was one of my students. So um, I've been around a long time <laughs> in Southern Oregon. And um, I, in fact, when I first started teaching, when I was 21, fresh out of college, I taught at Medford High School. And so I left Medford and went uh, for a time to San Diego, to Helix High School, and then also to um, Texas, outside of Dallas, to Plano. And so I had a lot, I, I had 10 years of public school experience, and that really helped me with the teacher ed program and, and uh, teaching um, and, and directing uh, students in their professional careers. Let's see. Um, I want to go back to Bev Bennett and Joe Widness and Ruth Beber and Marion Forsyth because they were really the backbone to women's sports at Southern Oregon. They, um, they, they had programs in place, although at times they had to transport the women's teams in their own car. and. Uh, but they were part of the Northwest College Women's Sports Association and actually were uh, on the board of getting that started with um, AIAW, which was the American Intercollegiate, uh, Association of Intercollegiate Sports for Women prior to uh, NCAA and NAIA taking over the women's programs. So they were really instrumental in starting the sports programs at uh, SOC and then SOU eventually. Well, when I started, the, po the student population was probably around 3,000. So I'm, I'm amazed now that it's, it has doubled. But, um, and the students were mainly from uh, Southern Oregon counties and Eastern Oregon counties and um, very loyal to the program, very interested. And as I said, we put out a lot of teachers and coaches um, <clears throat> in health and physical education and athletics. My greatest challenges, uh, personally, okay, was making sure all the time that uh, the women sports were progressing toward Title IX. And as I said, uh, toward compliance of Title IX. And as, as I said, when, we, when I got here, they were, um, had basketball practice in the small gym. We had, if we had any type of um, need for sprained ankles or any kind of, of athletic training needs, the athletic training office was in the middle of the men's locker room. So we either had to wait until they vacated or else set up a separate appointment for, uh, for women to be treated. The, we, it, as far as uniforms, we tried to use the same uniform for volleyball, basketball. Um, let's see, we had, and, <clears throat> and other sports as we could. So, and now of course, every sport has two or three 
different uniforms that they have for just themselves. So that was the biggest challenge, was Title IX. The other challenge were the continual cuts in our budget and uh, having to eliminate some of our sports programs. And uh, that was really very difficult to do for the coaches and for our student athletes. Um, we had skiing, we had swimming, water polo, baseball, softball, tennis teams, men and women's tennis teams, and track and field and cross country. And we had to eliminate uh, swimming, water polo. Uh, in the early 80s, we had to, to eliminate uh, men's tennis first, and then women's tennis, and um, the ski program. So all of those uh, really f affected our student athletes as well as our faculty. And uh, as you look at it now with the programs that we have, it's really a backbone to our student population as far as number of, of student athletes who come and participate. Um, personally, I was always uh, trying, trying to get on tenure track, get associate professorship, getting professor, um, and to that level, and in doing so, um, going to summer school and uh, pursuing a PhD program. And Dr. Ernie Etlick at that time really helped me uh, get through my PhD and, and made special time for me to take exams, uh, get a sabbatical so I could do my residency. And I'm forever appreciate, appreciative to him and the Carpenter Foundation too, who helped with uh, some of my funding. So that, that was always, and I never really felt secure until I got my professorship and my, uh, my PhD as far as my, my job. Um, I think that our health and physical education program with the, the leaders from our department who held many um, president and vice president positions in state organizations and Northwest organizations, I think our, our program was really well respected. And um, I was very sorry when the health and physical education was uh, divided into uh, nursing, school of nursing is one of the things that we went into. Uh, and then I think it's, uh, I don't even know what it's with now, but uh, uh, you know, athletics and health and physical education is such a different uh, scene with um, so many aspects, health promotion and fitness and out the outdoor program and teacher education, uh, so different from any other school on campus, let alone the facility. And so that, that was disappointing when they um, put our school, combined our schools. And at that time, too, I was school director of health and physical education. So that was a really a blow to me. And um, I could have gone back into department chair, but at that time, I just decided I wanted to go back into teaching, which was my foundation to begin with. So I finished as a teacher professor. How did I see women's sports evolve during, the, during my time? Um, a, gr a great deal, and I, I brought, I brought the, in the notes as to what actually Title IX is. So let me tell you what Title IX is. No person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination un under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And so, uh, it, and there were a lot of lawsuits that came up and they took forever because no one could really interpret that. And uh, at one time, the football program was excluded. That was one interpretation and uh, so that was very hard to interpret, and um, to this day, 
In fact, I, I was looking um, at the statistic uh, about 10 years ago, maybe more, on, uh, I think about 50% of, of uh, institutions had reached compliance. I think that's, and, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> and here's what you needed to do to, to reach compliance. Let me get these. These are my old overheads. Athletic financial assistance, accommodation of interest and abilities, equipment and supplies, scheduling of games and practice time, travel and per diem, tutors, coaches, locker room practice and competitive facilities, medical and training facilities, housing and dining facilities, publicity, support services, and recruitment, monies for recruitment. So those are all things that uh, were costly to equalize, and that's one reason why we had to cut, keep cutting sports, is because uh, a lot of the pro the monies for athletic programs needed to be 50-50. Uh, it was very, really hard, as I said, in the early 80s, uh, it was very hard to interpret exactly what it meant because they kept going back, are we including football? Football was the big issue. And um, if not, can we, can we drop men's tennis without and keep women's tennis? And those kinds of questions came up all the time. We just didn't know how to interpret it. it do we have to give, another thing was the financial aid. Uh, it, can we, as I, I can remember Joe Witness and I in one meeting saying, can we use the financial aid that the Raider Athletic Association gathers if we get our portion, can we use it for other things besides scholarships? And of course we can't, we couldn't. We had to give it as aid because interpreting Title IX, it is a 50-50 thing that women have to have the same, same different, or, or the same um, commodities, so to speak, as the men. It's a 50-50 thing. And, um, but, but that wasn't really clear at the beginning if we could use, if we get the same money, if we had to use them for the same things. And um, I know we wanted to use our financial aid money either uh, in improving our programs or if we could split it to everyone on the team. You know, so we didn't have to pick and choose who was going to get the financial aid. And um, I, I can remember going to meetings on, on this and um, the men coaches just did not want us to get into their financial aid um, pot, so to speak. But they had to, they had to. And actually, as um, some of our male coaches had daughters, and finally they, you know, they really helped. They didn't know this, and I don't think I ever said it to anybody, but I could see that they wanted their daughters to have the same, you know, same things as they did, as their team did, and, and pushed for that, so. And probably their daughters did too. <laughs> so Title IX, um, athletics, drama, band, any other ex extracurricular student activities are considered to be educational programs under this law. It uh, also prohib prohibits all forms of sex discrimination in federally funded educational institutions, including sexual harassment, discrimination in admissions, in counseling, and discrimination against married or pregnant students. So all of those areas had, had to show compliance. There was um, the, somebody designated as a Title IX compliance officer, but very few and very, <laughs> We threatened to, we actually did, but also uh, a lot of coaches who uh, followed through 
in, um, <clears throat> in suing schools for such as coaches in, in a Division I school not getting as much money as their um, like women's basketball and men's basketball not getting the same uh, amount of money for salaries. Um, I know <coughs> University of Oregon had a, a lawsuit on that and the woman lost her job. And that happened time and time again on women pursuing different aspects of Title IX and losing their jobs. So it was a really touchy situation. I think the softball coach at University of Oregon and um, a, a basketball coach at University of Oregon and others all over, all over the country have lost their jobs because of uh, pursuing equality. We were all pursuing it, you know, the equal, the equal rights. In fact, when I first got here, this just came to mind, there was the Purple Girdle Society. And it was, we met once a year or so whenever a woman got a special award or got her PhD. And that was, that only, I, I went to a couple of those and then it was just, for some reason, just finished. And there was also a bo uh, early on a uh, faculty wives and that was dropped. Probably Rosemary had something to do with, with that. And um, yeah, cause, and I think it was all because more and more women were being hired in uh, positions and saying, hey, we don't get that opportunity. Why, why should they? Well, women were perceived as supporters for men's and boys and, and men's athletics. And um, I think that, uh, you know, some really pursued it. For example, um, women could not run in the marathon, the Olympics, the marathon and the Olympics, because they, someone, a physician or someone said that because they were uh, going to be mothers and mother figures and their menstrual cycle and all of this could not handle that endurance type of activity. And so I think Joan Benoit was the first um, in the Olympics to run the marathon. And of course today the women are running ultra marathons and, and uh, that was such a fable that uh, uh, <laughs> I, I can't imagine. I mean, somebody's saying you can't do it, and you can. I mean, women can. And um, so I think that was a perceived thing was that women were weak, weaker, and that uh, we were supporters for our men's sports and boys' sports. And then just, you know, girls started competing, women started competing and showing and breaking those trends and fables. How to use Title IX now, and that is, um, it's a powerful tool for com combating campus violence, especially sexual violence. And so uh, I think SOU has one of the leading, uh, leads the way uh, across the country in getting the police department to work with them on Title IX um, issues with sexual assault. So it's not just, um, you know, athletics by any means. It's a total education program. Okay, one of the things, how did you see women's sports evolve during your time? And um, I'll, I'll go back to my time, and that was when I was growing up in Springfield, Oregon, close to Eugene, um, in high school. We had mainly intramurals and play days and sports days for girls. And um, of course, I was always interested in sports. And so I did everything I could, but it wasn't, um, you know, a sanctioned league type event like the boys did, because we were in pep squads or cheerleaders for the boys' teams. So um, 
it's grown. I mean, the girls to, and women today um, have no idea what it was like not being recognized and having uh, the competitive opportunities that boys had. In fact, right now our women's volleyball team is playing in nationals and, uh, you know, that was out of the question. And uh, so we've come s so far in giving girls and women's opportunities to compete. What do I recall of Bev Bennett? Beverly Bennett was um, quite, quite a woman. She was actually a dancer. Uh, she introduced field hockey to SOU, and she was one of the leaders in the Northwest Women's Sports Association with Marion Forsyth. And uh, they traveled together and had bas uh, basketball and field hockey teams. Joe Witness brought on the volleyball team and uh, coached well into the 80s and had a, a lot of success. And she also coached tennis, Joe Witness. Um, Ruth Beber was a swim coach. And um, she was in teacher education as well and really taught with, uh, uh, we all called her the sergeant. But she, um, she was a very interesting woman. And all of them were mentors to me. And um, I appreciate what they did. Um, so, yeah, Bev was, uh, I, I don't know if you remember the dance room that we had on the, in the old building before they tore the building down and built the new rec center and, and gymnasium and sports arena, but uh, there was a beautiful dance studio and dance, and she taught uh, contemporary dance mainly and just was a really good athlete herself and, um, and president of the Oregon Association for Health, Physical Education and Recreation. And um, just all of those women were very professional and, and um, very good mentors for me. In fact, I have a picture of, ben, of Bev Bennett that you might want to put in the archives. and. Uh, I, she, she graduated from the University of Oregon in 1948 and then did advanced uh, uh, graduate degree at UC Berkeley. She was the outstanding graduate at, in health and PE at the University of Oregon. And she had several Northwest and national positions. She was on the Governor's Commission on the Status of Women um, she was an honored citizen of Ashland by the Chamber of Commerce. And she was on Jackson County Women's Commission uh, for, and also had the School of Health and Physical Education Faculty Merit Award. So she was um, quite a woman and very interesting and um, yeah, a good athlete and a good mentor for me. Yeah, Rosemary did a lot. Did a lot for women on campus. Yeah, and also, oh, the changes in faculty. Um, that's really been that really amazes me right now because the big offices on campus were um, housing, registrar's office, financial aid officer, uh, student union director admissions officers, and those were all really big positions that were long-lasting and had, uh, uh, oh, and then dean of students, dean of women, and dean of men. Um, and those were all um, really high-profile, I'd say, positions. And now I, uh, some of those have been totally eliminated, and some of them are, it looks like to me, um, stepping positions that, um, you know, I, th I think they were eliminated partly because of their, their salaries, and that was one way to cut down, but I don't see those positions of prominence anymore. 
And, dur and I don't see on campus, too, I don't see the loyalty. And I think another reason is because there's so many adjunct professors that are more transient. And uh, yeah, the loyalty issue uh, really concerns me because I see uh, some of the staff really dissing SOU and I don't like that because I've really been loyal myself and um, I want others to be like me. <laughs> but uh, well, um, she was temporary, wasn't she? A temporary position, but I think very important and very, um, we all really respected her and what she, what she did and her style. And uh, since we've had several female presidents, but and then several females in um, you know provost position positions and um, um, I feel like um, going back to President Reno and Cox, those uh, two men really were in a difficult situation because of finance. And um, I know that's when they tr tried to combine schools. And um, I didn't appreciate that at all. And uh, in President Reno uh, came from a small college. It, feel, it felt like an el elitist position. And um, it was a time when as school director, I can remember saying, we really need to cooperate with RCC and do some things with RCC. And he had no interest in that at all. And now look at the collaboration that we've done with them um, has been very successful. And um, so, yeah, I don't exactly, I, I just remember that uh, Sarah Hopkins Powell was a real light to uh, to have her in a position uh, after dealing with uh, Cox and Reno. <laughs> well, I think President Schott has really uh, helped with that, and uh, she communicates with the faculty so well. And um, you know, with her emails, I mean, every week she's writing an email to the faculty and and uh, attending a lot of events. And I, I don't see the, a lot of faculty uh, at many events. And hopefully she'll, she's promoting that and getting people um, into, whether it's uh, drama or the Schneider Puse uh, Museum or the athletic events or music or whatever it is on campus that some of the faculty uh, participate. And, um, you know, get there with their students and be a part of the activities. And I think, you know, I think a part of that is because I feel like part of our faculty is real transient and um, going to the next level somewhere else or, um, but, but I think, yeah, I think just, just more participation on campus. And I think doc, Dr. Schott is promoting that. Speak up. I think you know, for a long time, I think women didn't speak up, sat back and took, you know, because a lot of the times they were answering to men in, in roles that uh, hired them or evaluating them. And I think that women just need to speak up and uh, get their names in line for some of those roles. And I think that's what they're doing, yeah, quite well. I love being here. I felt like I had so many opportunities. In the 80s, Chuck Mills was the football coach and the athletic director, and he really gave me a lot of opportunities professionally. And um, I'm grateful, for, grateful to him for that. And um, because I was associate athletic director with him and uh, before becoming school director because I really loved my job here and the opportunities that I had.